Hello. So, oh, hello. Hi, Rhonda. <laughs> So thank you. I know we've had some technical difficulties. I did. It's 100% my fault. I don't want to blame anybody else. <laughs> no worries. No worries. You aren't the only one. This is a whole new uh, world we're in with virtual meetings and our virtual conference. So um, we've had a few hiccups, but I think we've uh, gotten over them and, and things have been successful. Oh, so good. Well, good. this one was so, my fault. I, I, I tried to get on it. 10, but I probably should have tried to get on a little earlier than that. So that's not a problem. <laughs> yeah. Not a problem. Yeah. So I just posted a few things and chatted with our attendees here. And okay. at the end, we'll be posting a survey. We're asking people to fill out and you'll get that feedback. So um, presentations for everyone it, to know that they will be recorded and available on the association's website. Mm -hmm. And I do want to let you know, I want to make sure all of our attendees have their um, audio muted so we don't get feedback. Um, as Kim presents, if she pulls up a PowerPoint or any other document, any attendee can double click on that particular box and it'll maximize it so you can see it better. Um, and then you can always go out of that again as well. Um, so with further ado, I'd like to um, introduce um, Ms. Kim Trent, Deputy Director of Prosperity with the State of Michigan. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Kim. Good morning, everyone. And I, again, so apologize for being late. I um, have to admit, I, um, technology is not always my friend. And so knowing that I sh should have probably gotten on, I was advised to get on uh, 15 minutes earlier. Knowing myself, I probably should have made it about 20 or 25 because I... Uh, can be a little clueless. So I am so sorry about that. It's certainly no one's fault but my own. And I do want to take responsibility for making you wait. I hope that I will be worth the wait. And I thank you so much for your um, patience as I navigate this new reality that we have um, in our new virtual world. So um, I am, as was mentioned, the Deputy Director for Prosperity for um, the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity for the state of Michigan. It's a new position. Um, just last year, Governor um, Whitmer did create the um, Michigan Poverty Task Force. And that is a um, one of my chief duties in that position as the Prosper um, Deputy Director for Prosperity. Um, my the thing that drives me um, in my work every day is trying to create a more prosperous Michigan by um, helping those who are living in poverty transcend poverty um, and those who are living in poverty be able to live in poverty with dignity. Um, I respect so much the work that you're doing with your Michigan Works agencies um, to ensure that people have access to economic mobility. Um, and I thank you for the work that you do every day. Um, certainly, uh, I think that you heard earlier today in your presentations about the 60 by 30 initiative of the governors, which is really designed to help um, our citizens upskill so that we will have a more robust economy and that people will have um, the kind of income that they need to live lives of dignity, um, being able to pay their bills comfortably. And so um, we come from a state, I, I am a native of Michigander and actually my family has been here for about five generations. So um, we are certainly a state that at the turn of the 20th century was one of the most prosperous states in the country. Um, our over-reliance on the auto industry has in some ways um, impeded our ability to um, maintain that standing. Um, but as we try to again um, diversify our economy and have um, more um, options for our citizens. We also need to have a better trained workforce so that when those jobs come, there are um, people to fill them and they are able to have those more lucrative um, job opportunities. So um, I am very happy to serve in this role. Again, it is a new one. I do have a PowerPoint that I would like to share and I'm hoping that maybe Rhonda can help me figure out um, how I do that. I'm just, um, oh. uh, Kim on the bottom, mm -hmm. uh, you'll have the little toolbar and the little red line through your screen. Sure. You click is on that. The share? Okay. It should pop up. Okay. There is a little bit of a time delay we have found. So okay. you might have to give it a little bit. Excellent. Okay. So we're going to start the presentation just momentarily. Just one sec. Oh, And I just want to remind everyone once the 
presentation up. If you hover over it, you can double click it and it will enlarge it on your screen and minimize Kim a little bit. Mm. So, okay, I do. I Oh, there we go. Ah, there we go. Okay. <laughs> All righty. Okay, so um, again, um, I am the director of uh, Prosperity for um, Leo. Uh, and um, the governor created the um, Michigan Poverty Task Force with an executive order in December of 2019. Um, because she recognized that there is no single solution to poverty, she really tried to have kind of an inter um, or a um, multidimensional approach to this um, to poverty. And so we have 19 department directors who serve on the Michigan Poverty Task Force. Uh, not just one department. I think a lot of times when people think of efforts to alleviate poverty, obviously people pivot to um, the Department of, of Health and Human Services, um, probably Leo because Leo obviously deals with um, employment. Um, but we recognize there's there are almost no state government departments that don't um, interface with people who are living in poverty and the issues and programs that address uh, poverty. So um, the reason that the governor thought this is important is um, the United the uh, Michigan Association of United Ways um, has issued reports talking about what they call their ALICE rate. ALICE stands for Asset Limited Income Constrained and Employed. Um, and what they found is 43% of Michigan families have a hard time meeting their monthly survival bu budget. And um, by survival budget, we're not talking about the frills, we're not talking about um, vacations and um, the extras in life, we're talking about being able to pay for utilities, for housing, for um, basic um, communications, um, for um, childcare, those things that you really need in order to have um, a, a life that is um, comfortable and um, lived with dign dignity. So. Um, our goal is to reduce the ALICE rate um, by finding efforts to help give families the support they need and really to try to leverage all of state government so that um, everyone has a role in this uh, work. So again, um, this, this chart kind of uh, spells out what the ALICE rate is all about, things like food, housing, child care, health care, um, what the budget would be for a single adult in Michigan, and for um, a, a two family uh, or two adults and um, two children, when you're talking about things like childcare, everyone on this phone or um, most people are familiar about how very expensive childcare can be. Um, technology, we're talking about just the basis of technology, being able to have access to the internet and um, a phone. Um, taxes, which is something that everyone has to pay. Uh, so what does that require? So for a single adult, it would require a minimum of $10.52 an hour um, in wages. For um, a, a four-member family, you're looking at a minimum of $30.64. So, you know, that's significant. That's a lot more than what our minimum wage is here in Michigan. And as a result, you've got about 43%. Um, a little less than half of Michiganders who are not able to um, to comfortably afford to pay these basic um, expenses. So what is contributing to Michigan having such a high ALICE rate? And um, obviously, when we look at our job market, and obviously a lot of our work and a lot of the um, research we did was pre-COVID. But certainly COVID has not um, alleviated any of these problems. They certainly, it certainly um, actually made them worse. So what we've seen in our state is obviously we have very low wages or not very low, but certainly um, there are more low wage jobs than um, the kind of jobs that will get you over that Alice threshold. Um, wages are stagnant. We're not seeing people um, wages kind of keeping up with the cost of living. Um, we're seeing shrinking support from the government. Certainly here in the state of Michigan, there has been a real look at how our TANF dollars are deployed. So the very poorest among us um, are not really getting the, that access to TANF dollars. Um, it's being diverted to other um, other um, uh, causes in the state of Michigan, other uh, programs. And as a result, 
um, those who really rely on those dollars are not having access to them. Unemployment insurance, um, if you know anything about our system, the way the system has been kind of designed by in the past was to make it difficult for people to access it or difficult for people to get the full benefits um, that um, they perhaps do. And so um, we've really tried to reverse that given the why, the, the exponential um, increase of people who are relying on unemployment insurance because of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, Leo has really worked, um, has really done a, a yeoman's job of trying to figure out how we can get unemployment insurance benefits adequate unemployment insurance benefits to our citizens. Um, the cost of living has gone up while wages have been stagnated. And then because people have spent so much of their income just trying to pay, um, pay bills and stay afloat, they have not been able to build assets and therefore the um, household, um, uh, the, the um, amount of money that households have is not as it had been in the past where people were able to save and purchase um, housing or purchase you know other kind of assets or, or things to help them with their bottom line um, so that they can pass on things to their um, children and their children. Um, those things are not happening in this economy. We're seeing, seeing people using um, far too much of the, the wages that they earn to pay bills. And you know, as I just spoke about the fact that um, wealth is, you know, in a lot of ways inherited. Also, what's also inherited is kind of your economic status. So um, what we have found, there's a, um, a researcher at Harvard University named Raj Chetty who found that if you um, are the child of someone who has um, a certain um, income status, it's very likely that's where you will be too. And so, um, you know, that's certainly not what we have in the past envisioned as the American dream. The American dream is that everyone by kind of their own grit, determination, skill level um, is able to succeed, but far too often um, income status in this country is inherited. And so those parents who went to college, their children typically um, at least have the training and the access to go to college. And those who did not, it's much more difficult we know for first generation college students, there are a lot of barriers and they're not all economic. And so it is our job, we think, as state government to improve that so that more people truly do have not just access to higher education and access to opportunity, but really the um, skill, the, the tools and support that they need. Um, you know, I think that a lot of times people discount how important I, I'm a former university board member and I can say that. Um, we were a school that was kind of infamous. I was on the board of Wayne State University, which was pretty infamous for having extremely low graduation rates. The year that I joined the board, our six-year graduation rate for undergraduate students, for African-American students, was about 8%. So 92% of those students who start an undergraduate program, who started an undergraduate program at Wayne State in those years in 2013, um, were not finishing in um, six years. And so, um, what we found was you had to have those supports. It was good to have programs to give people, um, make college more affordable and to help um, students be able to matriculate to Wayne State University. But, it, you know, we really had to work on making sure that they finished I mean, because being accepted to a college means almost nothing. It's really about whether you get that degree in the end. And so um, as we look at how we're approaching poverty, we're looking at the end goal, which is to helping, which is helping people transcend poverty. It's not just um, making poverty um, survivable. It's really to make it, um, make people, um, make it something that people can transcend. And so um, as we have done our work, um, we had our first poverty task force meeting about two weeks after I started this job. I started in January of this year. Um, we had our first meeting with our 19 department directors in the end of January. And um, then I set about sitting down with the department directors and we divided our work into four different um, kind of work groups. And so um, the first one we're calling Safe and Secure, it's about preserving and um, tightening those safety nets that ensure that people can live with housing security, food security, that they have their utilities and they're living in safe spaces, that they um, are able to, um, live in, in areas that are um, relatively safe from crime. Obviously, crime is 
often a result of the lack of opportunity. Um, and then rebuilding that safety net. You know, I was just talking about TANF and um, opportunities like that. Strong Beginnings is our work group that deals with childhood poverty. So we are really looking at child care, which is something that the governor has um, kind of identified as a um, major um, issue that she wants to look at in her and, and try to address in her administration. Um, certainly youth employment is something that we think is really important. And then those youth interventions for um, those um, young people who are at risk to make sure that they um, have the the um, support and tools that they need to make good choices. And then also addressing trauma. We know that trauma is uh, the lingering effects of trauma definitely follow um, people into adulthood. And so we want to address them at address it at a very early age. Removing barriers is probably the, the uh, work group that works most closely within state government. All of this is within state government, obviously, although we are hoping to um, expand partnerships with external partners because we recognize the state government alone um, can't do all of this work. However, when we talk about removing barriers, we're really talking about those structural barriers that exist in state government. So, um, for example, uh, the there used to be regulations and there still are some regulations that prevent returning citizens, people who are leaving um, from incarceration, from being able to pursue certain lines of work. Um, we are taking a hard look at those regulations and why they exist and why some of them shouldn't, so that when people leave um, prison, they have more tools so they're able to get jobs. Um, first of all, we're trying to boost job training that goes on even for those who are incarcerated, those who have a path to um, being um, free um, so that when they leave, they have skills um, and they can get jobs. We also, um, one of the things that was recently um, kind of an example of this removing barriers work is that um, the Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson and our Michigan Department of Corrections recently announced a pilot where they will be giving um, um, people who are leaving incarceration uh, state IDs or driver's licenses because they found that um, getting those documents are, you know, you know, in your life that without having identification, day-to-day um, -day life is actually quite difficult to be able to get jobs, to be able to get housing, to be able to um, just identify yourself if you want to cash a check. Um, it's almost impossible to navigate adult life without some form of ID. And so um, as um, formerly incarcerated people are leaving prison, um, as they are paroled, um, they are automatically getting driver's licenses or state, well, not automatically getting driver's licenses. Obviously, they have to, um, just like the rest of us, have to um, prove that they are able to drive a car, but um, they are getting the kind of identification that they need in order to be successful. Um, and also, they are being um, registered to vote. So um, those are the kind of things that we're doing with the removing barriers. We're looking at those state regulations, state rules, state laws that are really preventing people from being able to have economic mobility. And then for the long-term strategies, because we recognize while um, you know, we are trying to work on things like making sure that people who are living in poverty can do so um, with you know, security, with um, knowing that they um, are going to be able to eat and have somewhere to live and um, be safe. Um, we want them, again, the ultimate goal is for them to transcend poverty. And so our last work group is called Providing Opportunities. So uh, that is the one that's really laser focused on that long term strategy of moving people out of um, out of um, their um, into more economic um, opportunity. And so uh, things like higher education access. So when we talk about the 60 by 30 initiative, trying to get more Michiganders to get those high quality certifications, credentials that will help them get jobs of the future, job and, you know, we're kind of putting an eye on jobs that are recession proof and also that are not easily automated. We know that um, the workforce is changing and um, we have already seen how some entire categories of work, work have either been eliminated or significantly changed by automation. So how do we get more of our citizens to get into some more of our workforce to get in jobs that will not be as um, vulnerable to those realities? So um, as it relates to the removing barriers, um, um, economic mobility work group. Um, 
So uh, we are we have several policy recommendations, and obviously this document I should tell you a little bit more more about the timeline for the poverty work um, the poverty um, task force. Right now, our work groups that I mentioned, those four work groups that I just outlined, are have been working for the last two months to really take a look. So when I met with the department directors, I spent the first two months of the year, first almost three months, um, having individual meetings with each each of those department directors to talk about the programs that they already have in play that help people who are living in poverty and to talk about um, the programs that they've seen in other states that have been highly effective, that if we had the money, we would do this. If we had the partners, we would do this. And um, we have put we put all of those ideas in a spreadsheet and um, we asked those department directors to loan us their staff members and those um, their kind of um, most innovative minds to try to really sit down with the ideas that um, they have proposed and also in, in concert with ideas that we got from external sources um, to really kind of evaluate how they might work in Michigan, um, what some of the best practices are, how they would be implemented. And um, actually last Friday was a deadline for those work groups to get those documents back to us. Um, and these are just a few of the ideas that were put forward um, to help us um, in these four kind of um, policy areas that we're working on. So when I talk about removing barriers, I just talked about the partnership with um, allowing um, offenders to leave prison with a state idea driver's license, um, really looking at um, criminal justice reform um, so that the number one reason that, um, um, or one of the highest reasons that so many people are um, put into kind of um, custody is because they didn't appear for kind of low level tickets. So how do we address that where we have accountability without um, putting people in jail, which is preventing them from being able to make money, preventing them from being able to have jobs. A lot of times they'll end up losing their job, which just adds to our economic instability. So we're trying to look at how we can leverage the criminal justice, um, uh, the criminal justice, um, um, how we um, do, how we punish people um, so that it's not about being punitive, but it's about being accountable. And we are not, um, you know, in the in kind of shooting ourselves in the foot in the meantime. And so I know that the lieutenant governor did have um, a task force that went across the state and then did issue a series of recommendations to the governor and the attorney general about um, some of these strategies, and that's um, some of the things that we have also picked up in our strategies for um, removing barriers to economic opportunity. Um, certainly listening, looking at how behavioral health um, issues are addressed in our justice system. Um, far too many people are in prison because they're mentally ill. How do we help people um, deal with their behavioral issues so that they are um, able to still work, able to support their families, able to um, live in society without being a threat to themselves or others and um, you know getting those those needs addressed instead of incarcerating people who have those needs so again that's part of that um, criminal justice reform um, apprenticeship opportunities um, I talked about that a little bit for inmates while they're incarcerated we do have a program now that I know all of you are familiar with um, with in some of the prisons where prisoners are being um, who are about to be paroled are being um, trained for jobs, for example, with utilities. Um, lucrative jobs, jobs that will very are very comfortable for people. Um, we are trying to be um, really proactive about figuring out how we can have more opportunities like that. And again, I talked a little bit about TANF already. And um, we're also looking at how benefits are allocated so that um, when there's a transitional period, when someone is making more money and might not be eligible for a benefit anymore, how do we extend that transitional period so people aren't just, you know, as the name suggests, people talk about benefit cliffs. It's like a cliff. You're thrown off a cliff. You have stability. You have maybe child access to child care or access to health care, and then suddenly you don't. So we're trying to figure out how we can make that um, a smoother transition. Um, again, other things um, in the, the proposals that we are going to be offering are things like um, prisoner education programs, having a clearinghouse to, um, you know, collect kind of best practices and technical support for um, organizations that are working with the hard to employ. Um, regional transportation initiatives, having lived in uh, southeast Michigan my whole life, I certainly understand um, 
how that can be a real barrier for those who are seeking jobs because we have sort of, sort of reverse commuters who have a really difficult time getting to those suburban jobs. Um, so those are the kind of things that we're talking about in our recommendations for removing barriers. Providing opportunity, as I mentioned, is the work group that's talking about kind of um, the long game. How do we help people get access to that next level of um, economic st stability? And so obviously a big part of that, um, we want to boost the number of college graduates, graduates in our state by 2030 by about 10 percent. So um, we get there by offering um, last dollar financial aid for co community college students. Um, but then we also recognize that we have to have more of our citizens, although we have about 80 percent of Michiganders who have um, high school diploma, or I'm sorry, that's the number for Detroit. Um, but there are a number, we have a, well over the majority of uh, Michiganders have a high school diploma, but there are many who don't and don't have GED. So expanding access to just getting that basic credential. There used to be a time when people would very much celebrate getting a high school diploma because that was the end of the road. Then you just started your work life and you had a comfortable work life and you were able to make a good living. Um, those days are, it's very challenged to make a really comfortable living with just the high school diploma. But we have to remember there are segments of our um, uh, citizenship, of, of, of our, um, there's segments of um, those who live here in Michigan who don't even have that basic credential. So we have to address that. Um, the digital divide, that was really laid bare by um, COVID-19. We saw when particularly K-12 schools, um, K-12 schools, and certainly even higher education, when um, classes went online, um, it really kind of laid bare the have and have not. And it's not just an urban problem. I think a lot of times there's a focus on cities like Detroit where there's a clear um, difference in the number of students who have that access to those uh, that equipment. But certainly in rural communities here in our state, there are entire rural communities that do not have internet service at all. And so we have to figure out how we can help cities better negotiate that so more of their um, residents have access to those kinds of um, services. Um, just teaching about financial literacy is really important. And that's something that we believe that we have to have a strategy to make sure that underbanked and low income people really understand so that they're not taken advantage, advantage of by um, operators who might not necessarily have their best interest at heart when they are doing things like cashing their checks and giving them loans. So we wanna make sure that they have access to that information. And then individual development accounts, we know that um, certainly those of us who have children who we're hoping to send to college one day, we, um, um, some, a lot of us have those college savings accounts. How do we expand that for maybe low income people so that they have um, opportunities to save even when they have, um, maybe when, when they're low income, how can we partner with external partners and others who will help us get um, those um, those families that really want to have their children to have access to um, either a college education or some post-secondary um, uh, educational opportunities, how do we get them there? Safe and Secure is the um, policy group that I told you about that is going to be dealing with um, just making sure that people have basic needs met. And so, um, you know, we're talking about things like um, a home repair fund. We know, um, you know, when you go around cities like um, Detroit that um, have had a lot of blight, um, families, uh, this was used to be a city that had a relatively high home ownership rate. However, um, because wages have been stagnant and because wages in some cases um, have not kept up with um, the cost of living, um, people have not been able to make, in some cases, those very needed repairs. They are proud of being homeowners. They may have owned their property for many, many years, but um, there could be repairs that desperately need to be made, but they just don't have that extra money in their um, budget to get them done. And so we have to figure out how to help them out. Um, energy assistance is something that we talk about a, a lot in our state, particularly as it relates to water. That has been a very hot topic here in Detroit, um, trying to figure out how we can um, give some relief to those um, families that are really struggling to afford basic utilities. Um, thinking about health as a, um, from a social, social determinant um, kind of lens. So you're not just thinking about health from an individual 
um, basis, but as a population um, uh, approach. So what are the things that are contributing to, for example, I think probably the most glaring example of recent times is, of course, COVID-19, where you saw cities like Detroit just kind of um, devastated. Um, you saw that uh, African American, the African American community was much more impacted by um, COVID-19. What are the factors that contributed to that disparity? So those are the things, um, you know, one example of how we have tried to address that um, right now, again, is the COVID-19 racial disparities um, task force that's being led by um, Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist. Strong Beginnings is our policy group that's dealing with childhood poverty. So how do we expand unemployment insurance? Um, you know, that's something that has been kind of uh, the director of um, LEO and uh, those who handle our um, unemployment um, agency have really worked hard to help Michigan um, supplement unemployment payments because um, the threshold that we had before was way too low. It was not a survival. Um, it, it was not enough for families to necessarily survive on. So how do we make sure that more families have access to unemployment insurance, particularly at a time like this when we're in a national crisis? Um, we also are very supportive of um, increasing the earned income tax credit, something that we um, uh, they used to enjoy um, support on both sides of the aisle. Um, we think that we can get back there. We want to try to push for it, um, maybe expanding EITC to people who are on workers but might not have children, um, students, uh, and others, so that um, it is it's more um, it's, we can expand it a bit. And then we want to um, you know we want to be innovative. Uh, we know that here in the state of Michigan, a lot of our recent college grads end up leaving the state. Um, we definitely have um, a talent. Um, we are sometimes um, losing our talented young people because they want to go to places like Chicago and other cities. So how do we um, have strategies to make Michigan more attractive? One thing is like perhaps phasing in the state income tax so that um, recent um, college graduates are more inclined to stay here in the state of Michigan. Um, and then for um, homelessness um, prevention, how do we um, get programs in place so that people don't lose their homes, so that they don't um, face eviction? Um, we wanna make sure that we are expanding access to those kind of pro programs. So we talked about um, strong beginnings. I think this is in here twice, but um, one of the things that I didn't talk about was um, improving, um, expanding access to high quality care for areas that have shortages in, in care. Um, that's something that the governor has really identified as a priority, um, making sure that um, more people have access to um, in-home care, um, home visiting programs such, such as the Nurse Family Partnership, um, Medicaid expansion, um, so that um, you know maternal and infant health programs get more support, and um, expanding eligibility requirements for Medicaid or programs like CHIP. So we want to figure out how we can get um, uh, the children access to um, more and better health care. Um, so, you know, those are just some of the programs we're looking at. So you, I know, already heard a presentation, so I won't linger about 60 by 30, but, you know, certainly when we're thinking about, uh, in LEO particularly, um, this is one of our real priorities, trying to figure out um, how we can bump the number of um, Michiganders, working age uh, Michiganders, um, who have a skill certificate or a college degree from about 45% where it is today to 60 in just 10 years. So um, that is something that we really are laser focused on and um, we recognize that Michigan Works it has got to be a, a partner with us on that work. And so we encourage you, um, I know that you um, um, probably are aware of it already, but we certainly have the 60by30.org website to help you with that. <clears throat> Um, you know, I'm going to skip this slide because, again, I know that you already saw a presentation about 60 by 30, but um, it just talks about, um, you know, the goal and how um, our strategy to get there. Again, bumping up the number of um, BA, um, BA completion by about 10 percent, having more migrants come to the state who have um, those skills already, um, enrolling more um, um, Michiganders in uh, community college 
and um, you know, having more of them complete. Complete is completion is extremely important. Enrollment is good. Completion is really kind of the whole game, though. Um, and then just boosting the number of um, people who have those journeyman cards um, for uh, with those apprenticeships. So, um, you know, 60 by 30, again, I'm going to skip this just because I know that you've already heard it, but um, certainly we see other states like Kentucky and, Mich and um, Tennessee that have had um, significant gains because their business community and their state government have made um, boosting the number of um, folks who have those post-secondary credentials um, a priority, and they've worked, all worked towards that goal. So in the short term, while um, the COVID-19 crisis is still in play, we're really trying to push Michiganders to look at how they can upskill. Um, and um, we have a, a landing page in the LEO website called um, Skills to Work. And again, um, you see this email address here, which is um, michigan.gov um, forward slash skills to work, where um, someone who may uh, be interested in pursuing a college uh, degree or um, training with the Michigan Works Agency, but doesn't really know what to do. Um, it kind of guides them. It helps them figure out even um, helping them with some of the work that you guys do to help them kind of figure out what it is that they're interested in, um, what it is that might be um, a a next kind of career step for them. And so um, we do have those resources on the Skills to Work um, web page. And then I think you're all familiar with Futures for Frontliners. Um, I think you heard a presentation this morning from um, um, Carrie Ebersole um, about that program, but um, certainly we think that this is going to be critical. we have I don't know if Carrie told you the number, but a significant number of Michiganders have already signed up for it. So we know that there is um, interest in um, people recognizing that um, while they were um, proud and, and, and very brave to um, be those kind of um, critical workers, critical, critical infrastructure workers during this crisis, um, that might not be where they want to end their career. They might want to um, have jobs with a little bit more stability, a little bit more income, a lot more income. Um, so uh, we really want to give, we want to reward just as the GIs were rewarded with the GI Bill after World War II. We are really looking at this crisis and saying those brave men and women who um, went to work every day during this crisis um, to help us um, have um, safety and comfort. We want to make sure that they are rewarded with the opportunity to have economic mobility. And that's what Futures for Frontliners offers. So some of the things we've done within the um, poverty task force, we're actually trying to work with the payday lending industry um, because when we talk about that Alice population, a lot of our working uh, people who are just kind of on that line of not being able to pay, um, pay their bills, rely on payday lenders. We're trying to um, steer them, work with the, the industry to help them steer um, those folks to Michigan, to Michigan programs that will help them so that um, particularly right now during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, so food um, assistance programs and others, um, a lot of these folks really have never had to rely on those kind of programs before because they've always worked. They've had to struggle to pay their bills, but they've been able to do it. Now, because of COVID-19, a lot of them are, are very, um, are really compromising the ability to do that. And so we're trying to partner with the payday lending industry. We have made some momentum on that. Um, we're trying to do a better job of kind of aligning um, DHHS and UI um, data so that they can better um, partner. And um, so when there are, uh, when people who are unemployment, who are, uh, um, who are eligible for DHHS benefits, um, there's an opportunity for there to be better outreach. And so that's something that we're working on as well. Um, we did do a, a town hall to explain with, explain to our stakeholders about the eviction um, diversion program that the state has in place. And, um, you know, I've been working, I'm a member of, or I've been a staff member working with the COVID-19 um, task force, racial disparities um, task force, just trying to ensure that we learn lessons from this COVID-19 crisis so that in the, in the future, we can have um, better outcomes when it relates to, as it relates to um, people of color and um, how they um, how they are affected by a pandemic by COVID-19. 
Um, in the initial executive order that established the Michigan Poverty Task Force, um, there was a um, there was a mandate that we establish a advisory council, and that's what um, we have done. The council was to include three um, legislators and three um, people who are working with people who are living in poverty. And so those are our um, advisory council members. As you can see, we have um, state representatives, Brenda Carter and Scott Van Singel. Um, we have two Democrats and a Republican. Um, we have someone from a rural area um, who, who represents um, Grant, um, Scott Van Singel. And then we also have urban um, representatives in state Senator Adam Ollier and Brenda Carter. Um, we have um, Grand Rapids represented with Anna Diaz from Community Rebuilders, um, Donna Gibbons, who is the president of the Eastside Community Network in Detroit, um, which is a, um, a community development agency on the east side of Detroit, and then um, Lori Johnson, who leads the um, Senior Corps program in Greenville. So um, yet once again, we have the west side of the state, Detroit, and um, a more kind of rural area represented on our advisory council. And so they advise us. Um, we use them as a, a sounding board for these policies that we're hoping to um, present to the governor. Our goal, um, as we um, fine tune the proposals um, that have been examined by our work groups, our goal is to get a final document to Governor Whitmer by December of this year. And so that's where we are with the Michigan Poverty Task Force. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, we certainly value Michigan Works and recognize that the work that you do every day will certainly be a benefit to us as we um, talk about um, as we talk about how we hope to um, uh, help Michiganders who are living in poverty. Um, uh, you know, be able to transcend poverty and help those who um, are living in poverty be able to do so with dignity and um, safety and security. So um, I, I don't know how much time I have left, but I'm happy to answer questions no, if I do. You, you have plenty of time. And I just realized okay. we're both wearing polka dots today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a polka dot person, but I, I do. <laughs> I like yours too. So thank you. uh, there are a few questions in the chat that I'd like to read to you, address those. So the first one was what geographic area are you piloting for the returning citizens getting the state ID as they leave correctional facilities? So my understanding is that's for all of the, um, I believe that that's the entire state right now. So I, I think there's a time limit for it, you know, for the pilot, um, but no, it's, it, it's not geographically limited. Okay, great. Um, another one is, is uh, quote unquote, ban the box still in place in Michigan? So um, that is something that we considered um, when we were talking about our um, barriers to economic mobility. However, there is some research that suggests that when um, municipalities or states um, institute ban the box legislation, what ends up happening is there ends up being more or a different kind of discrimination that takes place so that you can't ask the questions and sometimes employers will decide for themselves or try to guess if you have a criminal background because they can't ask the question directly and they um, all of their kind of implicit implicit biases feed into their perceptions. And so um, it is something that we looked at. I think for this go round with the initial um, agenda that we'll be presenting to the governor, we're not going to include ban the box. All right, thank you. There, I just have to say there were a lot of very positive comments and related in relation to returning citizens obtaining that state ID coming out, because uh, uh, staff members spend a lot of time trying to secure that for people. So that's definitely a benefit. Um, and there was yes. m many comments about TANF being uh, needed to help stabilize people. Uh, so I don't really see any other direct questions. Um, if our attendees have questions, please type them into the chat and we'd be sure to relay them. In the meantime, I uh, would like to just once again give a shout out to Oakland Michigan Works for sponsoring um, this 
workshop for us today. And I am going to be posting here in just a moment um, the survey link for this workshop. So please take a moment to fill that out and we'll relay that um, information back to our presenter. And I want to thank you for inviting me. Um, I, uh, you know, again, we know that we are very close partners with you in this work. And so um, to the extent, I think I did put um, uh, my, I think on the last slide, but I'll actually put in the chat my email address in case anyone wants to follow up with me. Um, you know, I would love to hear your thoughts and ideas and um, feedback. Yep, she's got it. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I so I dropped the survey link in there. So I ask everybody to please take a moment to do that. Um, I don't see any other questions. Do you have any final comments, Kim? No, just uh, again, thank you so much for inviting us. Um, again, we're hoping to present our agenda to um, Governor Whitmer by December. And um, so there's still plenty of time for um, to you to offer your feedback. Um, again, the presentation I gave you today is very preliminary. Those are just some of the ideas that we have been um, ruminating on and talking about and um, examining. Um, many of them will make the final agenda, some may not. Um, we do plan to, one thing that I, I neglected to mention is that we do plan to do um, a, um, uh, a round of meetings, um, virtual meetings with stakeholders um, throughout the state um, about the agenda once we kind of shape it up and get, uh, you know, preliminary sign off from the governor. And, um, you know, we will definitely take all of that, it, take that into advisement as we um, present a final document to the governor because we recognize that um, people who are living in poverty and the practitioners who work with them every day um, sometimes have a lot more insight into uh, well, you know, kind of the well-meaning um, policy that um, us bureaucrats might um, devise. We, you know, come to it with our experience. I don't mean, and I'm not in any way trying to diminish the, um, you know, hardworking um, state employees. Um, but I think that we are just saying that we have a lot of respect for those who are in the field working every day. And we do want to get that feedback as well. All right, thank you very much. Well, this uh, concludes uh, the workshop today on the Michigan. Now, if I could just mention one more thing oh, yeah, that I please. have to say. Um, we do have a um, town hall meet or a, a meeting tomorrow um, for those who might want to get some more information about futures for frontliners. Um, at three o'clock tomorrow with Doug Ross, who is kind of the, um, guru, the uh, Futures for Frontliners guru, um, is going to do a presentation about it. And so anyone who's interested in that, if you can just shoot me an email at my email address that's in the chat, which is TrentK1 at Michigan.gov, I'll make sure that you're invited to that. Oh, excellent. Excellent. So once again, I'd like to thank you, Kim, for taking the time out to share this very insightful information. There's a lot of very positive comments in the chat if you've been watching those. Um, at this time, um, I'd also like to thank all our participants for joining us and hope that you have some great takeaways and enjoyed this feature of the conference as well as future workshops and general sessions. Uh, we have an exhibitor networking break next and this is the opportunity to visit our um, exhibitors or um, watch the informational videos in their booth and or go to the networking tab to be paired with somebody. Uh, following that, we have our uh, keynote speaker, Paul Artelli, will be coming on. Uh, so be sure to come back in uh, to hear his inspirational story as well. So thank you again, Kim, and to all our thank participants. You. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.